Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel or if you're new here, welcome to my channel. So today's case involves two murders that have gone unsolved for almost 20 years and it's just such a bizarre case and I just hope that by adding some exposure to this case and spreading some awareness that maybe someday soon we will get some answers. But before we get into today's video, I just wanted to go ahead and say a big thank you to today's sponsor, Schoolyard Snacks. How often do you crave a sweet or salty snack but you feel a little bit guilty because you don't want to throw off your healthy eating. If you're anything like me, I love my salty snacks and I need to eat something sweet or chocolatey at the end of pretty much every day just because I have a sweet tooth, but sometimes I hesitate because I don't want to ruin a healthy eating streak or I need to make sure I'm getting plenty of protein that day. But Schoolyard Snacks has completely changed the game. Schoolyard Snacks is a new brand that is recreating the sweet tooth treats and junk food favorites without the extra carbs, sugar, and calories. As for salty snacks, I personally got to try the classic cheese puffs and the spicy cheese puffs. Now, when these came in the mail, I gave some to my roommates and a couple of other friends to try, and we were all so surprised with how good they taste. We read the label, and usually with a lot of these sort of protein snacks, they have a lot of weird additives and chemicals, but the Schoolyard Snacks cereals are gluten, grain, lactose, soy, and sugar-free, while their cheese puffs are gluten and grain-free, and they are keto-friendly. I love that they're low in carbs and high in protein because as a vegetarian, I pretty much live off of carbs and I struggle to find ways to add some extra protein into my diet, but Schoolyard Snacks makes it so easy. I love how convenient it is to just order online and have them delivered straight to my door. They're really great for on the go, like if I'm running late for a clinical or for school and I just need a quick snack, or when you're being lazy and just laying in bed binge watching Big Brother reruns like I do, or any other show or movie that floats your boat. I just love that I can now lay in bed and eat my snacks feeling completely guilt-free knowing that I'm adding some of my daily protein intake while doing so. Now, I really like the spicy cheese puffs especially because I feel like they have the perfect amount of spice and cheese flavor. I let my friend take a couple bags and she took so many because she just absolutely loved them. She always snapchats me that she's eating one. My personal favorite is the original cheese puffs because I just love anything salty and cheesy that satisfies my craving every single time. They also have a sour cream and onion flavor, which is very intriguing, and I'm definitely trying that one next time. I also got to try the Schoolyard Snacks cereal, and once again, my friends were all so surprised with how tasty they are. I have the cocoa and cookie and cream flavors. I love both of them. They are so sweet and delicious, but I especially love the cocoa flavor. Like I said, I'm pretty much always looking for something to satisfy my chocolate craving, and these are perfect for that. They also have cereal flavors in apple pie, fruity, cinnamon bun, berry, and peanut butter. There are literally so many options and I want to try them all, but I'm especially excited to try the peanut butter ones and Cinnabon ones next. Schoolyard snacks are a healthy and delicious snack that fits perfectly with your nutritional and your fitness goals. You deserve the great taste without any of the guilt and for a price that's honestly not too bad. So make sure you go ahead and click the link down in the description box to get 10% off of Schoolyard snacks plus free shipping. I absolutely love them and I know you will too. Schoolyard Snacks even knows you'll love them, but if for some reason you don't, they do offer a 30-day money-back guarantee on all orders. Thank you again to Schoolyard Snacks for sponsoring today's video. So, with all of that being said, let's jump into today's video. Today, we are going to be discussing the unsolved murders of Lisa Guerreri and Brandon Rumbaugh. Lisa Guerreri was born on July 14th, 1984 to John and Paula Guerreri. Lisa was described as an energetic, outgoing, and bubbly young woman. She graduated from Mesa High School, and at the time of her murder, she was a sophomore at Mesa Community College studying business management and had dreams of becoming a wedding planner. She sang in the choir at the Christ is King Catholic Church, and she worked at Salt River Project in Arizona. She was just the type of person to smile at everybody and say good morning to everybody she saw. Lisa's father unfortunately passed away of cancer when she was very young, so her Uncle Mike took over and helped raise her, so he thought of her as his own. Uncle Mike said that she sang at his wedding and was just such a joy to have at his wedding and just a joy to have around in general. She was known as the type of girl who could brighten anybody's day. At the time, Lisa was dating a handsome 20-year-old man named Brandon Rumba. 
Brandon Rumba was born on May 7, 1983 to Robert and Desiree Rumba. He graduated from Coronado High School in 2011 and then went on to join the U.S. Marine Reserves while attending Arizona State University. He was described as spontaneous and goofy with a great sense of humor. He was always making everybody around him laugh and he was very optimistic about everything that he did. He was described as this tall, skinny kid growing up, but he built himself into this big big, muscular, strong man. He loved fitness and working out, and he had big dreams of one day opening up his own gym. But for the time being, he worked as a personal trainer at the Fitness Works gym in Mesa. He also loved music, just like Lisa, and he also played drums in a local band. He also loved to paint and sculpt, and he was really just this man who had many talents and passions. The couple was described as having a really amazing and healthy relationship. The two lived together in Scottsdale, and they had had plans to be married someday. Paula, Lisa's mother, said that Brandon treated Lisa like a queen and she really liked him. I'm not sure if this is 100% true, I saw this in some sources but not mentioned in others, but apparently just before the murders, Brandon and Lisa had just gotten engaged, but Paula had never gotten the chance to see the engagement ring. Now, in October of 2003, Lisa and Brandon decided that they needed to do something really special to celebrate their first year of dating. Initially, they planned on going to Disneyland, which would have been around a five-hour trip from where they lived in Scottsdale. However, this idea ended up being really expensive, so they opted on going on a camping trip together instead. They ended up going to Bumblebee near Sunset Point around 60 miles north of Phoenix off the I-17. Bumblebee, Arizona is known as a ghost town in the Bradshaw Mountains nearby Bumblebee Creek. This is a campsite that's very commonly used by RVs in the winter when it's a bit cooler to be outside during the day. So it's definitely a little bit of a desolate area, but it's definitely a well-known and busy camping spot. Now, Lisa had never been camping before, so she was a bit nervous for this new adventure, but she loved Brandon, and she was really excited to get some time alone with him to camp and stargaze. They asked Paula, Lisa's mother, to borrow her white 2000 Ford F-150 pickup truck for the trip. Paula was a little bit reserved to let them borrow the truck at first because one, it needed an oil change, but two, these were two kids going on an adventure and who knows where they would be taking that truck. But she did end up letting Lisa and Brandon borrow the truck for their anniversary. They planned to leave in the evening on Friday and promised to return the truck by the next day, that Saturday. So on October 17th, 2003, the couple set off on their adventure. Brandon hugged his mom goodbye and she told him to be careful. She gave them a couple of extra blankets and told them to give her a call if they needed anything. Lisa asked her mother not to tell Uncle Mike where the two were going because she knew that if he knew that he would really worry about her. The two set off for their adventure and eventually the two landed at their campsite on Bumblebee Road. However, when the next day came without them coming home when they said they would, Paulo really began to worry. Brandon actually had work that day and he was definitely not the type to miss work, so when he didn't show up to work that morning, his family knew something was off immediately. Immediately. So, a friends and family decided to go ahead and start searching around possible campsites that they thought that the couple could be at. Some of their friends suspected that they would be at Bumblebee Camp, so that is where they started their searches. And their searches did not last long before they actually ended up finding both Lisa and Brandon. They immediately spotted their truck in a dirt parking lot off of Bumblebee Road. And to their absolute shock and horror, friends found both of them still laying in their sleeping bags in the beds of their truck, both with multiple gunshot wounds to their heads. Of course, friends called police right away who showed up shortly after. They examined the crime scene and immediately ruled out the possibility that Lisa or Brandon had killed the other one and then took their own life, so they pretty much right away ruled out a murder-suicide. They also said that there were absolutely no signs of robbery or sexual assault and had no reason to believe that alcohol or drugs were involved whatsoever. It seems like it was either completely random or that someone was after them for whatever reason. But honestly, they were stumped. Lisa or Brandon, neither of them had absolutely any enemies and nobody around them could figure out why anyone would want to hurt the couple. So of course, their bodies were sent off for autopsies. They found that both Lisa and Brandon were each shot five times in the head with the same gun, both being a 25 caliber pistol. Now, they thought that it was a little bit weird because this is a rare gun to use in this sort of crime and we will discuss why in just a little bit. They also, of course, searched the area 
area and interviewed everybody who was at the campsite that night. Police believed there was as many as 1,000 people staying near that campsite that night, so they tried to interview as many people as possible and follow up on whatever leads they could. They also collected several bits of evidence from the crime scene. They collected several items from the trash and around a lot of common areas around the campsite. One piece of evidence that was of particular interest to investigators was a disposable camera found on the ground near the truck. Police had said that it looked as if the camera had been thrown out of the truck. It was found on the ground around 100 feet away from the truck by some rocks. So of course, investigators went ahead and developed any of the pictures that were on this camera. So one photo was of Brandon sitting in the bed of the truck. The other was Lisa in the bed of the truck sitting in a very similar way as Brandon, and both appeared happy and unbothered. These are presumed to have been taken the night of the murders. But then after these photos on the camera roll, so the most recent picture that had been taken, they found blurry pictures of a compact fluorescent light fixture in some sort of building. They didn't really know what the picture was of or where it was taken, but they believed that it was possible that this camera was thrown during the attack. And they thought that this last picture of this light fixture could give them clues as to what happened. They don't know where they were that night before they ended up in the parking spot that they ended up on, or if it was them who even parked in that particular spot. However, one thing that detectives did not find at the crime scene was a video camera that the family and friends of the couple knew that they took with them. They did find the camera case, but the video camera itself was never recovered. The family even knew the serial number on this video camera, so they would have known if this video camera ever turned up. But other than this, this case has been sitting cold for quite some time, and other than this, we don't really have any more information. Police seemed to have investigated, but nothing has really gotten them very far. So now, that brings me to the main theories in this case. So the first theory is that someone in Lisa and Brandon's friend group was involved with the murders. So this is the theory that Lisa's uncle, Mike, thinks is possible. He points to this particular friend who was in the initial search party as being responsible. According to Uncle Mike, one of Lisa's friends had very strong feelings for her and he wanted to be with her more than anything. The rest of the family even knows him and they all think that he definitely had the motive to kill them both. Not only did this man want to be with Lisa, but he was also with the group of friends that happened to find both Lisa and Brandon. Like I said, they sort of just assumed that they were going to be there and then they found them right away. But how would they have just known that they were going to be there? I'm not sure if Lisa and Brandon ever told them, but from the sounds of it, they didn't tell them because otherwise, why would Uncle Mike be so suspicious of why they found them right away? The other weird behavior that this man had was right after the murders. This man suddenly packed everything he had up and moved all the way from Arizona to Washington. And then, according to Uncle Mike, when they looked at his home after he left, the home was completely clean and absolutely absolutely spotless. There was nothing left behind in this house and it looked like he had cleaned every square inch of that entire house. This man was given a polygraph test and he passed, so he was immediately cleared by the detectives that were working the case at the time. But the detectives who are on the case now say that they want to look at him again and they agree that the crime scene was not properly investigated as thoroughly as it should have been. These new detectives said that they would not have just cleared anyone based on a polygraph test, so according to these new detectives, he's not cleared to them. So obviously, all of this does not look good for this friend, and it is pretty sketchy. However, finding the bodies of their friends does not necessarily mean that he was involved. He may have just known about the general area that they have been in. Maybe the couple had mentioned it to the friend group in passing and Uncle Mike just didn't know about it. Or maybe they had been talking about wanting to go there for a while, so the friends just knew. Maybe it really is just this popular of a camping site that they knew that they would be there. I'm honestly not sure. Then, of course, the other thing that you have to question is why, if he was obsessed with Lisa, would he choose to take her life? I could see this person wanting to get Brandon out of the way, but why would he kill the person that he wanted to be with? I could see a situation in someone's messed up mind where they think, oh, if I take away her boyfriend, she's going to be so distressed and be looking for a shoulder to cry on. And if she doesn't know that I'm the one that did it, she's going to come running to me as a shoulder to cry on. Now, I guess I could see that if she rejected him before specifically to be with Brandon, that maybe he killed the both of them out of jealousy. A sort of situation of if 
I can't have her, then no one can. I would be interested to know if any of the other friends notice any weird behaviors with him after the fact or if they know anything. I would also like to know how much police interviewed these friends in the first place and what they even said about the crime scene and everything surrounding it. The other theory is that this was a completely random attack. Now, in 2016, a cold case volunteer named Deborah West was working with the sheriff's office and she started to look into the case. Now, unfortunately, she has said that she hasn't really uncovered anything groundbreaking from this case that can actually solve it once and for all. However, she has been doing everything that she can to search for new information, reorganize old information, reread old interviews, and examine the evidence. She just wants a new set of eyes on this case with a different skill set than the detectives who had already been working on the case for years. Deborah thinks that Lisa and Brandon did not know their killer, so this brings up two main ideas. Of course, there is the possibility of a serial killer going around who happened to find them and killed them. That's always a possibility. But the other theory within this theory, which is the one that Deborah thinks is more likely, is that Brandon and Lisa were victims of a robbery gone wrong. She said that after looking at the evidence to her, it looks like someone tried to steal the truck, thinking that nobody was around. But then these robbers were caught off guard when they realized that there were two people sleeping in the bed of the truck. She thinks that these people shot the couple in the heat of the moment once they saw them. Now, one of the reasons why she thinks this is a very strong possibility is because just six months after Lisa and Brandon were killed, there was a very similar crime that happened just a few miles away. Two men from Yuma, Arizona were camping in Crown King when they were both shot and their truck was stolen. The suspect had fled, but then he was found in Colorado, but once he was found, this person took his life before anyone had the chance to question him at all. So to me, I definitely think that could be a likely theory. Now, I will note that I tried looking up what this case was, who was involved, you know, the names of the suspect, everything like that, but I couldn't find anything on it. So given this theory, I do think that there are a few things that are very strange that do kind of point away from a being a random attack from people just trying to steal a truck. First of all, the biggest thing to me is why wouldn't they have stolen the truck? Why just kill someone without leaving with the thing that you were there to take in the first place? If it was the same person who killed these two other men, then we know that this person clearly is not concerned about killing the people that he's robbing from. So why wouldn't he have taken the truck this time, that is a lot of risk with absolutely no reward. We also know that the killer left this disposable camera behind. The camera was found on the ground about 100 feet away from the truck in some rocks as if it had been thrown there. So to me, that means that this person could have been trying to get rid of the camera by throwing it and breaking it, or that it had been thrown by someone else during the struggle. We also have to consider that weird picture of the fixture lighting. Where even was that taken and who took it? It's just so strange. Strange. To me, it could mean that maybe Brandon and Lisa were not at the campsite when they took those pictures of them in the back of the truck. If they were the ones who accidentally took that picture of the light fixture, it could mean that they were taking the pictures inside of the truck and then stopped somewhere else to a building and then accidentally took that picture and then arrived in Bumblebee. So where else did they go? Did anybody see them? Or were they murdered at a completely different site that they were found and then the truck was just driven to this campsite for whatever reason? These are all questions that we get just from looking at all of these different photos. The other aspect to this case is that this person presumably took the video camera with them. Again, Lisa's mother knew that they had this video camera, but it was nowhere to be found. This does point towards the killer taking it. So that for me brings up two things. First is that maybe Lisa and Brandon heard someone coming and they kind of got this weird feeling. So they woke up and started recording their surroundings just to hopefully capture someone that may have been around them if someone really was there to hurt them. I know that they were found in their sleeping bags, but I think maybe they were sleeping and then maybe they heard someone coming around their truck and then they sort of just woke up and started recording as they were laying down and then just stayed in that position and didn't move in hopes that this person wouldn't hear them. Maybe they thought that they could be in danger, so they were hoping that if they were harmed, they could have captured whoever it was on camera. And then maybe the killer saw them recording this, and obviously he doesn't want to get caught, so he just took the camera with him. The other possibility is that maybe the killer recorded the murders. Maybe 
Maybe he saw the video camera there and decided to record the murders for a sick trophy. This does fit the bill if the person is a serial killer. We know that they have a lot of disgusting motives and like to relive their crimes as much as possible. Or maybe the person already knew that the camera was there. This could definitely fit the bill if they knew their murderer. If it really was a friend, a friend may have known that they brought the camera with them and if this was some sort of revenge and he wanted to watch them suffer, maybe he recorded it and took the video camera with him. Again, this video camera never being found ever again, to me, definitely points towards the person taking it with them. The other thing that I want to bring up is the fact that a 25 caliber gun was used for the murders. This is a big question in this case because a 25 caliber is a smaller caliber gun and is more so used for self-defense. So some people have brought up that if this was a calculated serial killer, why would he have such a small caliber? So that also points to maybe this being sort of a lie last minute type of thing. Maybe this person borrowed it or stole it from a family member and that family member just never came forward because they want to protect their family member from getting in trouble. I could also see them having a smaller caliber weapon in a robbery that's gone wrong. If they never really planned on using the gun against anybody and just sort of had it with them as protection in case they got caught or something, I could see them not really thinking about having the highest caliber gun. I do think a lot of evidence points towards this being a random attack and I think the fact that a very, very similar crime happened just six months after in the same area is too big of a coincidence to just ignore. But I do think there is a lot of evidence also pointing towards them knowing their killer. I wish that I could have found a lot more on this case, but honestly, I couldn't. Like I said, I couldn't even figure out more about this other crime or who the victims were or who the suspects were. I didn't see if investigators interviewed the friends or what they had to say about all of this. I have no idea about any of that. I don't know any of the other evidence that they took in. I don't know if there was any forensic evidence found. I have seen that they're hoping to run some DNA tests on certain things, but I haven't really even seen much about that either. I really do only have a short summary of this case, so honestly, it's really hard to tell what I think really happened. So honestly, those are really the main theories in this case. Again, I just wish there was more to this case because we really don't know anything. It's been 18 years and their murders are still unsolved and there really isn't anything being found in the case, so to me, our best bet is just sharing their story and making their case known. I really haven't seen this case covered much and I honestly feel like it's because we just don't know a lot about this case as much as we do in a lot of other cases. But I still wanted to cover this case because their stories deserve to be shared. I usually have a pretty good idea and theory of what I think happened in each case, but honestly for this one, I really don't know. I'm really looking forward to hearing your guys' thoughts and theories in the comments because you guys always come up with stuff that I never even thought of. Deborah and the rest of the sheriff's office are confident confident that this case will be solved because again, they are hoping that they can use new DNA technology to solve their case, but for now, it's still an open investigation. There is a $10,000 reward being offered for anyone who comes forward with information, so anybody who has absolutely any information regarding the murders are asked to call the silent witness at 1-800-932-3232. So that is all I have for today's case, and now I want to know what you guys think. Do you think that this was just a random attack? And if so, what do you think the motive was? Or do you think it really was this friend or do you think it's someone else who knew them? Please let me know your thoughts and theories in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. And don't forget to turn the notifications to on if you wish to be notified of all my future videos. Don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. Also, don't forget to go ahead and click the link down below for 10% off of Schoolyard Snacks plus free shipping. If you have absolutely any case suggestions, please send them to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. Pretty much every single case that I cover here on my channel is directly from that email. So again, please don't hesitate to send your suggestions over. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!